We've got some longer answer choices here. Maybe that means it's a harder question. Let's take a look. In Jane Austen's novel Mansfield Park, an almost imperceptible smile from potential suitor Henry Crawford causes the protagonist Fanny Price to blush. Her embarrassment grows when she suspects that he is aware of it. This moment in which Fanny not only infers Henry's mental state through his gestures, but also infers that he is drawing inferences about her mental state, illustrates what literary scholar George Butte calls deep intersubjectivity, a technique for representing interactions between consciousness through which Austen's novels derive much of their social and psychological drama. Ooh, I barely understand this, but it seems to suggest, I mean, this moment illustrates, my dumb summary is this whole thing is an example of something we talk about later. So hopefully, you know, uh, I've, I've, this is question seven in this little series here. You've noticed how my dumb summaries are basically kind of predicting the purpose and things like example or contrast the, or term and definition keep coming up. Those are very common purposes or functions for these underlying sentences. So it's not surprising that we keep seeing the same thing, right? So obviously the choices and the passages keep getting, uh, being, or just keep changing, but still uh, that's helpful to think of it as an example. So let's, let's take a look. It states a claim about Austin's skill at representing psychological complexity that is reinforced by an example presented in the following sentence. I, I, don't, I don't think that that's right, right? I mean, it uses the word example, so it's a little bit of a trap. But like the example is the underlying portion, and then the, what it's an example of comes later. So I, don't, I think it's got it backwards, right? Um, and I don't think it's really stating an, a claim about Austin's skill at representing psychological complexity – uh, it doesn't really say, it just says it's Jane Austen's novel. It doesn't say that this is something that's particularly good. Maybe later we get that, that this is a, a technique that she uses. Um, I just still don't think even later we get the sense that this is something that it, like it, it we're describing as a particular skill of hers, but maybe, um, I guess maybe it's through which she, they derive their goodness, I guess. So I don't know, but honestly, this just seems backwards to me. So yeah, backwards. Um, so just be careful. Definitely a trap. I, I feel like both parts are kind of true, but the order is wrong. B, it advances an interpretation of an Austin protagonist who is contrasted with protagonists from other Austin novels cited in the following sentences. No. Are there other novels? I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. And contrasted, it just seems like, again, it's an example of something, not an exception to some other rule. C, it describes a recurring theme in Austen's novels that is the focus of a literary scholar's analysis summarized in the following sentences. Sentence. That seems tempting. I'm going to leave it aside because is it a recurring theme? I guess they maybe later on say that they she uses this this thing, this uh, this um, intersubjectivity. Uh, so maybe um, I don't know. I don't love the word theme. It, it seems more like a moment. An, an action or something like that, not a theme, but uh, okay. Uh, let's look at D. It provides a synopsis of an interaction. So synopsis means summary, summary of an interaction in an Austin novel. Yeah, right. Imperceptible smile. They, you know, she blushes. That seems like, that seems like a summary of an interaction uh, that illustrates a literary concept discussed in the following sentence. So turn this into a question. What's the literary concept? Deep intersubjectivity. So look, I would pick D here, no doubt, because I understand it better and I, and I can turn it into questions. And then those questions are very easy to answer by pointing the line. I really wouldn't go back to C and, and pick it apart or, you know, sometimes people have this very bad habit of you have a clearly wrong answer, but you're so afraid of it. Like you just, you need to like, almost like try to prove it right as a way to prove to yourself that it's not right. It, it's kind of weird. So Try to resist that urge when you've got like such a nice win in choice D to like spend more time proving choice C wrong. Like, like I said, it's, it's wrong because it's not really a theme. It's more like, like I said in D, it's an interaction. That's a much better word to describe what's happening. And by turning those little pieces of choice D into questions that I could then go point to the words in the, the passage and the underlying portion that like just match with that. That's, that's how I get confidence that I'm doing the right thing, right? Turn into a question. If the answer is right there, there's something you can point to. That's a good sign. If you have to kind of do like the, well, maybe they mean this to prove an answer. That's not proof. That's bad. That's you. So definitely D, move on. Don't worry about C. It's clearly wrong. D is right.